Jumping back now into the show and more on what we saw last night from the Baltimore Ravens and the Cincinnati Bengals. An awesome game, right? Everything that you would have liked, again, as a neutral fan, just watching, tuning into Thursday Night Football. It was everything, right? You had the scoring, we had the drama, we had the decisions, everything, the controversy, uh, as always. So I liked it as a, as like a Steelers fan, right? But from, from one side, you look at the Bengals, and if you're a Bengals fan, it just feels like more of the same, more of the, the same just gut-wrenching feeling where you're so close, you, you feel like you did everything possible to win, and still you you have six losses on the year and only four wins. And as a, as a Ravens fan, right, the win is great, right? You continue to win. Lamar Jackson continues to make his case for MVP if, um, if anybody still had any doubts, right? But... The win is great, but on the flip side of it, the defense, again, just so bad. It's just so bad and so sloppy that um, it's disgusting to see sometimes from, from the Ravens. It's just so unlike them to, to play like this. Um, so we're going to get to that in just a second. But firstly, here on the, the Bengals, we talked about the importance of these next three games for them and their playoff hopes, right? Their, uh, their game last night against the Ravens was going to be a big one, and arguably they should have won that game. Then you look at their next game after a couple extra days rest here against the Los Angeles Chargers coming up on Sunday Night Football, and the game after that against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So now that you already have a loss in this you know mini period of these next three games, the next two of them now become that much more important because of the fact that you not only want to win them, right, because you just need to win games at this point in the year, but the the fact that this Bengals team is 0-5 against teams with a winning record, that is, um, if you really want to make a case for the playoffs and legitimize yourself and really prove to yourself that you can compete and be in the playoffs, you can't not win a single game against teams with winning records, right? That's what everything is in the playoffs. It's the best of the best. The, all the best teams with obviously all winning records for the most part, um, you got to be able to beat those teams or you're most likely not even going to be in the in the final dance. So their own five against, you know, teams with winning records, I believe they're uh, four and one against teams with losing records. So now you have two more opportunities here to face two teams that one of them is in your in your division directly. So you're going to play two games against the Steelers kind of helping yourself while making them, you know, worse as well by losing for them. And also um, the Chargers, they're in sixth or they're in seventh place right now in the the wild card. So, you know, beating them obviously gives you the head-to-head -head and also tax on a loss for them and the records get closer. So it's um, the the level of importance, the level of significance now has ramped up for the for the Bengals that much more. And looking at their playoff hopes and the state, of them right now um you can't help but look back at some of these games and think like man like what could have been if this went that way or this call went in our favor here or if we would have just done this in this game it's a season of what if for the Bengals right for for the most part right because you look back and there's a lot of these games where in just the first game Mike Kosicki fumbles at the goal line who knows what happens if they at least score that touchdown. If everything else stays the same, they're at least tied in that game, right? So that's the first one that they end up losing. Then we have the pass interference call, obviously, at the end of the Chiefs game. That costs you the game. They kick the game-winning field goal after they get into field goal position from that penalty. So that's two losses, obviously. The, the Washington Commanders game. Felt like a game that was right there for them. Um, it just feels like they got surprised or they just weren't ready yet for the Commanders, much like a lot of teams were. But that's another game where you feel like you could have done more. Also, the first game against the Ravens, right? You look at the overtime period where the uh, where the Chiefs, not the Chiefs, the, the Bengals turn the ball over, you know, get the Ravens off the field. They have a chance to win the game with a game-winning field goal and they mishandle the snap. And that field goal goes wide, and the Ravens get the ball back, and they win the game. Another game that they probably should have won. Then you look at last night, another game, you know, probably should have won. I, no surprise, would have gone for one point there at the end, probably. But 
they went for the win, but it's not just about that play at the end. It's the the bad defense, just the the bad tackling and things like that. It's um it's very disappointing. If you look at all those games that I mentioned and they all flip to wins, this team is potentially 9 and 1 or at least 8 and 2 if we don't flip the Washington game. The one loss that they I would say truly deserve is probably the the Eagles game. They got their butts kicked, so at worst they could be 8-2 and two with the loss to the Eagles and the loss to the Commanders. But every other game, you know, there was a play or a sequence of plays that you look and they either messed up or um, it was just something weird that happened by their own accord more often than not too. And uh, it ends up costing them. So now instead of only losing one or two games on the year, you've lost an additional four or uh, even five more. So it's... It's tormenting, I'm sure, to, to think about. I'm sure they try not to think about it, but it's hard not to in such a weird season where they were painted as such, you know, contending teams. But for them to, to be in this position, it's very odd. And now, to me, looking at the rest of their schedule, you can't afford, in my opinion, to lose more than two games of their next seven that are left on their schedule. You know, they have the Chargers, like we said, the Steelers twice, and the, uh, the Broncos as their toughest opponents. And, you know... They're most likely going to have to win all of them. And all those teams are direct competition in the playoffs in terms of seeding and whatnot. So they're going to need to win those games. And then I know they have games in there against the uh, the Cowboys, the Browns, and the Titans, which they should win. So these, uh, these four games here, two against Pittsburgh, one in Denver, and one against the Chargers, are going to be just as important. Because like I said, if they lose more than more than two of them, that's pretty much it for them. It's looking a little bit dire right now, but uh, it's not completely over for sure. And um, then, then we get to the Ravens' defense. Like, man, like, where do we start? Um, where would this team be without? Imagine if they didn't get Derrick Henry this year, or if Lamar wasn't playing better than his MVP season. Everybody knew Lamar was great and everything, but to play better than an MVP season that you had last year already is remarkable stuff. And uh, unlike, it's so unlike the Ravens to see their defense especially be just so permeable and just very sloppy, disorganized, um, and you, you try to attribute it to some things. The, the easiest thing to point out would be the, the departure of Mike McDonald, their defensive coordinator. He's now the head coach of the, the Seahawks. Also, um, a direct, like, like cause and effect really their defensive back coach Dernard Wilson he got a a great job there with Tennessee to become their defensive coordinator but he was their defensive backs coach right the the secondary coach if you will and you look at where the Titans are now it's funny it's ironic actually that with Dernard Wilson as the Titans defensive coordinator the Titans this year are number one against the pass in allowing 155 passing yards per game that's the least amount given up by a defense in 2024, whereas the Ravens, complete opposite. They're in last in allowing 295 passing yards per game. That's almost double of what Tennessee is doing with Baltimore's former defensive backs coach, and it, it doesn't get any more ironic than that. Um, they're not going to hold him hostage, obviously, to just keep him there. If he wants to leave, he's going to leave, but um, it's uh, it's made a big impact, obviously, and... Their new defensive coordinator, Zach Orr, I'm not saying it's all on him, but it is his first year, so, you know, he, he can only get better with more experience, you know, being in more situations like this, but he is a first-year head or defensive coordinator, so there are going to come, that is going to come with some bumps along the way. And also, um, you know, just looking at some of these plays, right, where you look at the 70-yard the touchdown by Jamar Chase, where... I believe the Ravens were up 28 to 21 and Jamar just runs a post route, not even really doing too much. And you have Stevens essentially covering him pretty much, or they're playing quarters coverage and he's on the outside shoulder of Lamar, of uh, Jamar chase. And so likely because you have the corner on the outside shoulder, you're probably going to cut inside. And that's where usually the safety would be knowing that it is Jamar chase, knowing that, He's already killing you all night long. That's where the, the safety should be to provide some help. Be on the inside. The outside corner has the outside shoulder of Jamar. So Jamar's kind of trapped in the middle, right? If he goes inside, the safety's there. If he tries to cut outside, Stevens is there. But for some reason, 
Marcus Williams, where he is standing, he would have been in great position, but he drops to the flat route and stop and goes to like double Chase Brown. That's who who is in the flat route. He drops where the linebacker is already there covering Chase Brown, which you could live with obviously because Chase Brown wasn't really doing too much in the game. Instead of staying back and doubling Jamar Chase, running a post route, and then Stevens, you know, believes he's doing the right thing, staying on the outside shoulder, probably doesn't think that Marcus Williams is just going to drop and try to cover the flat. He stays on the outside shoulder, and there's nobody within like 15, 10 yards of Jamar, and he scores on one play. Then, the even before that, Jamar Chase scores on another one-play drive, essentially, where he catches the ball over the middle, a wide-open gap in the Ravens' zone, and he just just runs between everybody. Nobody lays a finger on him. And uh, those two plays really stand out, plus the the holding penalties that gave the, uh, the Bengals a couple extra lives, if you will, in some of the drives where Nate Wiggins was holding or Marlon Humphrey was holding. Overall, the execution, just the, the discipline and the communication is just all very poor for the Ravens at this point. And even still, like, like, T. Higgins isn't even out there, and Jamar somehow plays better in this game than he did when T. Higgins was out there, and it makes no sense that at some point, like, it's in the second half where I don't know where, what Jamar had in the first half, how many yards he had, but we're in the second half already, and Jamar has already scored the 67-yard touchdown to make it 21-7. to uh, 21 to 7. So for you to leave him wide open with Stevens on the outside shoulder and go to double somebody else, that's just, like, unexplicable. That's just, like, like there's no excuse for why Marcus would drop and not try to cover Jamar Chase. He scores another long touchdown. The The last touchdown was just an amazing throw, so that one really doesn't matter too much. But um, in terms of which is worse at this point in time, um, I would probably say the the. Bengals playoff hopes are in a worse spot or I'm more worried about the playoffs uh, the playoff hopes for the Bengals because I believe the Ravens they're already in last place in in passing defense so they can't get any worse they can't they can't get any worse than last there's nobody else so they can only improve from here whereas the Bengals I just feel like some of the players or the lack of some of the players that they don't have really is costing them um they're not really relying on their defense. The the tackling on the the uh, the Jalen or the the Tylen Wallace touchdown was very bad. Everyone just tries to push him out of bounds, and they don't. And he just tight ropes the the sideline and goes and scores. That shouldn't have happened. Um, elsewhere, they a lot of the their pass rushes. I I don't know if I'm nitpicking. I might be, but it feels like everything was very discombobulated. Like with Lamar. With any running quarterback, you'd like to keep them like kind of in the middle. If they break the, you know, the containment of the outside linebackers, that's where you get Lamar. What was it that he ran for like 58 yards on that one play where he almost scored? That's where you get those plays, right? And a lot of times I felt like the Bengals were pretty undisciplined in staying and containing Lamar. A lot of the times I feel like they went inside breaking that discipline and Lamar got outside and that's where he started creating a bunch of uh, of things that are just routine to him. So I didn't really like that from their defense anyway also. So on top of that, their offensive line is still pretty bad. It's in pretty bad shape. It's ranked among the 20s again this year. Um, Joe Mixon is a huge loss. He continues to be a huge loss that not a lot of people are talking about. Their running game, they're only averaging like 80, 90 yards per game. And you know, as good as Joe Burrow is, you got to help him out with something, right? Um, and making it so one-dimensional with an all-right offensive line doesn't really go together. Um, and it's it's kind of similar to Baltimore, which is also another ironic thing because you look at both defenses, not very good, two amazing quarterbacks, Derrick Henry, an all-world talent, Jamar Chase, an all-world talent for their quarterbacks. And um, the difference with the Ravens is that they actually went out and they have a much better offensive line and their running game is something that um, is very good. It's probably the best in the NFL where as the, the Bengals, they don't have a running game. They have great receivers and everything, but their running game is really struggling. The Ravens, while their running game is amazing, they have 
decent wide receivers. So they've done enough to go out and help Lamar. And uh, I just feel like this season not only has been a season of just what ifs, but also a season where the, the Bengals, I feel like they didn't do enough. They felt like they were contenders, and I just feel like that was an overestimation at this point in time. So it's disappointing, certainly, but you know the playoff hopes are still technically alive, but the, the margin of error, like I said before, is certainly very, very small at this point in time. So we're going to leave that there. Great game overall, but speaking about games this week, that was only the first one. We have a bunch more that we talked about in yesterday's show, and now in the next segment, we're going to get to part two of our game picks, finishing the the rest of the Sunday slate and giving my predictions and why I have these teams winning on a Sunday. So we're going to get to that in just a few moments. <laughs> 